And we're back. This segment is brought to you by Tenable Network Security. Looking for a career change? Tenable is hiring. Everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash Tenable Jobs. If you're listening to this show, make sure you check out the following two positions. Both are technical and both are work from home, which I believe our listeners would be into. One is a Nessus vulnerability research engineer and the other is a C software engineer. Come join the fine team at Tenable and uh, you can work with people like me. Maybe that's not such a resounding endorsement, but I do work there too so we could work remotely together. Or if you're in Rhode Island, you can come visit. There is another Rhode Island uh, Tenable employee, uh, and she's awesome, actually. When she comes, she brings pastry from LaSalle Bakery. It's awesome. Um, Security Weekly listeners, you receive 10% off all of the products in our store. Visit shop.securityweekly.com, enter the discount code IHACKNAKED, and receive 10% off our wonderful selection of Hack Naked t-shirts, which should be appearing on the... Screen rate about bum bum ba bum bum. Okay, well, if you go to shop.securityweekly.com, you can see pictures of all of the hack naked t shirts. We've got ladies t shirts, men's t shirts, black t shirts, red t shirts, you name it. I hack naked is the discount <coughs> code. This segment's also brought to you by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And we are here, finally, I've kept you waiting for an hour now, Israel, Israel Barak, co-founder of Centrex um, in 2011. He now cur- oh, still works there and currently functions as Centrex GM Business Operations for Americas, specializing in developing and assimilating innovative technologies and enhancing organizations' capacity to withstand cyber attacks. Welcome, Israel, to the show. Thanks for having me, Paul. Yes, it's a pleasure to have you here in studio. That's awesome. You made the the trek down from Waltham. Um, So, Israel, how did you get your start in information security? So, I started in the um, Israeli Defense Forces. You know, I was um, a student, you know, coming out of college, and I interviewed in the um, uh, Israeli Defense Forces uh, Information Security Center, which is responsible for developing, assimilating uh, organization-wide security systems, uh, encryption mechanisms, uh, security policies. And uh, it was uh, late 90s. At the time, uh, the glory pretty much went to the encryption side of the business, right? Mm -hmm. Building uh, encryption mechanisms, um, encryption algorithms. And there was this kind of a side business for all those other problems, which were called information security, right? But we're dedicated with uh, very little attention. So I remember the first interview I had, I uh, was uh, given a task. It was a, um, it was a, a, um, a crypto analysis task for the uh, uh, Bloom matrices uh, based encryption mechanism. And I sat there for hours and I, I couldn't get through it. I failed miserably. And the guy, uh, that interviewed me, um, who is to be my uh, my future commanding officer, told me, listen, uh, I don't see you going to the encryption side of the business, so I'm afraid it's information security for you. <laughs> You've been here <laughs> so, ever so, since. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, your role in the military was for service for your country, right? So everyone has to serve in the military, correct? Exactly. Um, Israel has a mandatory military service, so uh, pretty much every uh, young individual in the age of, uh, in the age of 18 uh, is enlisted. And now, um, you're not the first person from Israel to come uh, on the show. Karen Elzari was here with us a few weeks ago, and you, you mentioned her before the show. She's yep. awesome. Dear we friend. love Karen. Um, so, uh, what was your role in the development of uh, Israel's red team? Right. So, a few uh, years into my service, I uh, served about uh, 10 years in the Israeli Defense Forces. So, a few years into my service, um, information security has gotten more and more attention. It, you know, people began to realize that there's a very diverse set of problems that just you know, are not being solved well with a good enough encryption. 
And as part of building the information security uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, business, uh, we came to realize that there would be a lot of room for an organization that an organization that is able to uh, actively test the level of security and the ability of the different networks and system to uh, handle uh, cyber threats. And um, that's when we decided to form a um, an organization wide red team that would basically test potentially everything starting from IT systems to weapon systems to intelligence systems and networks. Um, no, on your own network, not other countries. Right? Yes. Okay, yep. just checking. Yep, 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 <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, so it was, uh, it was an interesting thing to start. I mean, I was, um, I was the first commanding officer of this, uh, of this uh, side of the business, the red team, and we started it from a security profession, right? So we had a lot of people that were uh, very good at doing information security, but the, you know, the question was, how do we start doing uh, penetration testing? How do we develop that cyber warfare um, capabilities? Because as security professionals, there is a theoretical understanding of how to do these processes, but there's a very big gap between the theoretical understanding and the actual implementation. Um, especially when you're talking about uh, compromising very complex, very large networks that contain, you know, both standard and proprietary um, technologies. Um, what was the reaction from the, the folks within the military, like, when you went and did the penetration test? Like, and then you presented them the results, like, early on. They, at some point, they had never had any kind of a red team assessment before. So, you know, here you and your team come along and you probably break into all their stuff, <laughs> and then you're like, you know, here's what we found. What was the reaction? So the, um, one of our tasks was to strategically choose the systems mm -hmm. that we wanted to do this kind of work on. So we chose both systems that carried organizational importance, mm -hmm. right, to under really understand what the risk is associated with these systems, but also the systems that would create uh, the vibe, mm -hmm. right, and emphasize the value of using this uh, this organizational capabilities for the different wings of the mm -hmm. military, and it took time because you know it's it's never an easy thing, right, for an organization to open up its doors to uh, an external team, mm -hmm. right, and and you know both from a uh, a uh, prestige perspective, mm -hmm. but also from a confidentiality perspective, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and that sort of reputation just took time to build. Yeah, right? I bet. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so any interesting stories from those days? Like, did you hack into, like, a tank? Or <laughs> is there stories that you can, yeah. you can share? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, I think the, um, you know, the, uh, the, first challenge that was interesting was to build the expertise. Mm. So one advantage is that you can, you can work with Israel's finest uh, uh, kids, mm -hmm. right? So since this is a mandatory military service. You have right? the talent pool of everyone in the country to pull e from. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. from a, a budget perspective, these guys are paid in the order of magnitude of 100 bucks a month, mm -hmm. right, during their mandatory military service. Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't cost anything to group together the best people that you can find. Mm -hmm. uh, the downside is the lack of experience. Yeah. So the question was, how do we build that experience as fast as possible? Mm -hmm. So one of the th first things that I decided to do was to approach... Uh, commercial organizations that were involved in penetration testing and that we uh, appreciated. Mm -hmm. And I told these guys, listen, um, you can basically get 10, 15, 20 of the smartest people that you can find in this country working mm -hmm. for you, basically for free. right? And the only thing we ask is that you let them participate in your ongoing activities. Right. Don't let them screw anything up. Right. <laughs> And that worked remarkably well, yeah, right? Yeah. Most organizations that we've uh, spoken with were very open to it. Mm -hmm. um, and within between five and six months, 
we notice that we can reduce our level of involvement mm -hmm. within those external projects and direct more and more attention at our internal projects and have these initial capabilities to start working mm -hmm. with. That's really cool. Can uh, I ask a question though? Yeah, you sure. know, I, I'm just, what I think is interesting is that when you get the, you know, as we put it politely, a talent pool of an entire country, uh, not necessarily earning a lot of money. Did you, did you have any surprises where you kind of looked at somebody and went, you're just not going to figure this out. And they, they brought you something that was just unbelievably remarkable because they didn't think about it the same way. They had no basis in it. They had no understanding. They had no training in anything related to red team. They didn't even know what it meant except for it was a color. And yet they did something by intention or by accident that you still take with you today because it was just that cool. I hope you got something because if not, that was a really crappy buildup. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, uh, um, I think it, it, it happened multiple times. All right, good. It, it happened multiple times. Um, you know, I think one of the first cases was um, we, um, we participated in, the, in an army exercise, right? Part of which was simulating a cyber, a cyber incident, right? And I tasked some of the guys to uh, build a um, a Trojan horse, right? That we would kind of kind of send to uh, specific targets, right? Kind of an exercise Trojan horse, and they did a remarkable job, right? And um, that thing apparently spread a lot more than we uh, than we originally <laughs> thought it would. <laughs> And I'm sitting there at the operations center, and I'm starting to see materials <laughs> coming back to me that I really shouldn't see. And it was, uh, it was that moment when I was sure I'm going to get my ring stripped off of me. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, but, but, but really the, uh, the uh, ability of, of these guys to uh, kind of address these problems, not from a prior knowledge perspective, but from an ability to intelligently analyze an operational situation, right, and to assume how the other side thinks and would build their system, um, proven to be very effective in targeting complex networks and environments. That's awesome. I just, I just, I mean, it's more of a personal thing for me, but I always hold that out as, so on one hand in security, we like to say people just don't understand and they can't get it. They're our weakest link. And yet time and time again, I, we can prove the exact opposite. Hmm. So that, that's awesome. I, I like stories like that where we take somebody who doesn't have any background and, you know, when push comes to shove, they kick ass. If I could jump in here and ask a question, kind of on the, the tails of that, but I'm taking it in a very different direction. So starting a red team from scratch in an organization like the military who holds security to its core, what are some, uh, um, ad what is some advice you can give to people like us who have to deal with trying to get buy-in from management who don't understand Great proactive question. security, they don't understand red teaming? What is something that you did that kind of got your commander to think in a different way or get the, you know, the hires up that you can give our listeners about how they can approach their own management to say, you know, we should really start thinking like the aggressors do. Right. So first of all, you, you, you've got to have that initial opening, right? But I think once we've gotten that initial opening, one of the best things about this job was to prove time, time and time again that perceptions that exist in the organization that's being tested are just uh, are just not correct. The best organizations I, I uh, or, or the organizations I enjoyed testing the most were security and intelligence organizations. These are th these are these guys are, are you know they're very good at what they do especially in the cybersecurity business and securing their systems. Uh, that means that when they're approached by a red team, they already have their uh, conceptions about what it is that we're going to find and when you you know kind of think outside the box you always come up with things that are very different from what they thought right when you start to think not from the technical perspective but from the operational perspective you end up with findings that are completely different than what they expected to see right and when you present these findings 
to the executives, they understand that there is a lot of value in bringing someone from the outside who thinks ex you know, entirely out of the box, right? And comes up with things that are, you know, were never even raised to them as concerns by their own, by their own people. That was at least my experience. When you guys position the results, do, do you position them as, we beat you, you failed, or, hey, good thing we figured this out before a real adversary did, and it's not a failure because we're on the same team? Like, how did you, so when you brought those results, how was it positioned? That was my, the first thing, thing I told every one of my men. You never make fun or even mm -hmm. imply to make fun of the people that you're testing, right? Uh, uh, it's, we, we all know this as, as security professionals, it's impossible to cover all bases, right? We would have made a lot of mistakes had we had to build those systems that we're currently testing, right? So we can't put ourselves uh, in any way above the people that we're testing. So we're always a part of their team, an extension of their efforts, Right? And we always present our findings in the most humble way, right? mm. as people that are providing service to them, right? and not as people that are testing them or criticizing them in any way. I, I, just, I think that's important. I'm, I'm really impressed that you guys did that. But I, I think it's important for people to hear that, too. Okay. I like the use of the word humble. Okay. And I think in that way, the things are received in the right way, right? Um, without any sort of objection, right? They're perceived as here's a, here's a professional finding, something that we may want to take into account. And at the end of the day, that's what we want to achieve. Um, Israel, you recently did a talk uh, in Boston called Signals, Intelligence, and Countermeasures. What, what was that about? What were some of the takeaways from it? So we focused this conversation about um, uses of signal intelligence techniques and, 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 and traffic analysis techniques to uncover covered operations mm -hmm. happening uh, on a large-scale network. So if you're looking at a country-level uh, um, network, mm -hmm. how do you uncover people or uh, groups uh, of individuals conducting covered conversations between them? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we, the whole point is they're supposed to be covert about it, so it well, doesn't it sounds very challenging. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is that in many cases, uh, the objective is not necessarily to know what it is that they're talking about, mm -hmm. but just to exclude them from the gen general population, right? And mm. know that you have individual X, Y, and Z, yeah, right. Yeah. Because they're uh, communicating in a different way than everyone else, so ex conceivably exactly. they should stand out. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. And we talked about the fact that uh, many people, uh, when they look at um, you know privacy, they um, try to achieve some sort of anonymity, mm -hmm. right, in their communication. But in many cases, this uh, this anonymity is what makes you unique. Right. right in the in, crowd, and in the act of trying to be anonymous, you stand out. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So they color, the, color themselves in a different color, which makes these organizations that want to exclude these special individuals, mm -hmm. they make their job a lot easier. Right. right. It's kind of like figuring out if you have a spy in your organization. Is it's it's yeah. it's it's definitely one of the use cases mm -hmm. of of these techniques. Right. That's interesting. Counterintelligence. Yeah, I thought all spies would go for a walk at random times at night and, like, you know, leave a letter <laughs> underneath the bench or something like that in a dead drop. They all carry chalk well, with them just in case. Yes, the chalk. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, one individual um, in the audience um, asked me, listen, um, he was probably looking at a lot of James Bond movies, mm -hmm. and he was asking me, um, listen, uh, why do these guys uh, even have to use standard communication devices? They can use a lot of gadgets, interesting gadgets, mm -hmm. right, to communicate between them so it'd be extremely hard for counterintelligence, right, organizations mm -hmm. to identify them. And it's, it's even though, the, you know, intelligence organizations have... Uh, uh, very substantial budgets, and they can't potentially build these uh, unique gadgets. Uh, 
it's the unique gadget that makes you unique. That makes you stand out. Right. Yeah. You yeah. go through airport security. Someone opens your bag, mm -hmm. sees something, right? And here's the question what that is, right? And you have to answer that question. Why do you have chalk? Right. <laughs> it was, uh, so, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's an interesting topic. It's an interesting topic, and it's a topic that I've, you know, I've gotten into. Uh, uh, I've, I've had the opportunity of spending a few years um, mm -hmm. doing. Can people apply those similar um, analysis techniques to detect espionage in their own corporate environments, right? Because your country is one thing. Much yep. of our audience is yep. like, well, I work for a company. I always use Coca-Cola as the example. I don't know why. Because yep. they're always rumored, like, the recipe for Coke is a super top secret thing, yep. right? So yep. they're obviously yep. very concerned about espionage, as are any company with intellectual property. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are various uh, products on the market that will allow mm -hmm. you to do that. The, uh, the real issue is yeah, there are technical challenges in deploying this product, mm -hmm. right? The ability to collect all the... Uh, network traffic into one central location, uh, store significant amounts of it, and process it in a timely manner. But the real challenge is really not the technical challenge. Mm -hmm. It's the operational challenge. And it's not something that you would see in a lot of out-of-the-box solutions. That that's something that needs to be developed mm -hmm. by the organization's analysts. right? And these are these patterns. right? They need to be able to lay out the patterns of what would an abnormal type of communication right. right or behavior would be right for that system to be able to pick up on that pattern i've always heard of products that claim to do that but i feel like in practice it it falls on its face a lot of times cuz there's so yeah. much chatter today, yeah. right yeah you're absolutely right and and most products uh they come out of the box with very simple things right things that you'd be able to see in in some uh, simple log files mm -hmm. right uh, but I think that in order to detect things like corporate espionage, mm -hmm. you need to be able to have a an operational level uh, analysts yeah, that yeah. can lay out the patterns, the operational patterns mm -hmm. of a corporate spy. Right, right, right. yeah, because it's different from it's it's not going to be lying there in a simple log that's file breaking in yep. to do other things, yep. right? Yeah, yep. they're different yep. patterns that you're yep. looking for. No, oh, it's very interesting. Um, so your you what do you do at Centrex that segues into WordPress vulnerabilities? Is that something you wrote up for your your work at Centrex? Right, right, right. I think so I said Cent Centrex is the local company, C E N T R E X, right. that distributes liquor to most oh, of the really? state. They're liquor <laughs> distribution. So when mm. <laughs> when Frank said it's from, <laughs> so I'm like, great, he's gonna bring all <laughs> kinds of liquor. This is awesome. <laughs> And it, no, it's Centrix, right? It is. Yeah, S-E-N-T-R-I-X, -E right. It okay, it's it a is. different company. It is. Um, although you've given me a good idea about a kind of a side business. That's right, yeah. It's, you know, they employ lots of people here in the state that deliver a lot of what's on our bar. <laughs> well, um, so at Centrix, we focus about us as a specific area that we've, um, you know, that I've dealt with over the course of the years, which is, uh, securing web systems mm -hmm. against cyber threats, right? So your data breaches, your uh, uh, d d distributed denial of service attacks. Hacked WordPress sites. Exactly. No shortage and, of those. Right. And, and what we're trying to do is, is, is basically to change the approach, right? Mm -hmm. um, typically, uh, web security technologies, uh, the traditional ones, require you to have a set of rules that would define how the application should behave. Like a WAF. Like a WAF. But I'm not a huge fan of WAFs. You're not a huge fan? No. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people are not. Yeah. <laughs> so, and there's a good reason. There's well, a good I reason. feel like it doesn't fix the underlying problem, right? I mean, it's similar to like a firewall. And, and Chris right. gives me a lot of crap. Like, you turn off IP tables. I'm like, dude, if the system's secure, we don't need IP tables, right? I, it kind of goes I, back, you I, know, I with totally Marcus agree. Random on the show, totally with him inventing the firewall, it still says the same thing, right? I, I totally agree. And, and to add to that, as systems became more and more complex, mm -hmm. personalized, dynamic, right, the amount of interactions that a user can do with a system became so big, mm -hmm. right? It can be in the thousands or tens of thousands. So traditional web application firewalls carrying all these rules just became meaningless because mm -hmm. you can have so many types of user interactions going to your network. 
It's going to be. It's amazing how many ways which you can do the same attack but have it look different when it comes to web applications, right? Now, from, from my perspective and, and my experience, the web security team in, in typical enterprises, these are good guys, mm-hmm. right? Potentially, if you would focus them on, 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 on a well-defined task, mm-hmm. they could have built a policy that even if the application itself is potentially broken, mm-hmm. right, the web security team could have been a pol- could have built a policy that would have mitigated that. Right. It's just that with traditional WAFs, the problem is so big, mm-hmm. right, and the amount of rules well, is so big. Well, and it changes too. So today, the web team does a great job. Our rules are awesome, but the dev team changes something tomorrow, Absolutely. and now it's obsolete. Absolutely. So what we what we try to do with um, with Centrix is to change this equation, mm-hmm. right? To create a situation in which we separate the application, an existing application, into a piece that is the user interface, right? That doesn't really re- do- doesn't really do any sort of business Logic, right, on yeah, the application. Yeah. It's just making the user interface pretty for exactly. people to interact with. Yeah. And then we virtualize this user mm-hmm. interface on a cloud platform, which we call a cloud DMZ. Mm-hmm. This is where users are actually going to be served from. Mm-hmm. And then we only transfer to the actual protected system that small group of the actual business behaviors. Right, right. right. Now, this process, this decoupling or this split process is an automatic process, right, that reduces the number of interactions that go to the back end, typically in the order of magnitude of about 99, 99.13%. Mm-hmm. So for a typical financial application, you would end up getting... 20, 30. Right. You're just seeing the business the logic business calls. Be it. Yeah. So we basically recreate that DMZ environment mm-hmm. that was supposed to be in place, kind of separating the public-facing aspects mm-hmm. and the business aspects, right? We recreate it on the cloud platform. All the public-facing aspects, mm-hmm. the user interface, is virtualized on the cloud platform. has no attack surface of its own. It's kind of a flat, static mm-hmm. right, version right. of the original. And then only that handful of business behaviors are passed back to the origin. Mm -hmm. And then we automate the creation of strong whitelist policies only for those business behaviors. behaviors, And now if the security analysts of the protected system wants to further tighten those rules, Mm -hmm. now they're not dealing with Mm 10,000. They're dealing with 20, Right. right? And as the application changes, we constantly update Right, mm-hmm. and push these changes to the Cloud DMZ platform and update the business behavior rules so they can always focus their attention mm-hmm. on a handful number of rules. Now, building security into the application is, is really, a, a, you know, pr- possibly the best solution. Yeah, that's where we'd all like to be, right. certainly. But what, we, what I've seen in many cases, especially when I used to c- try to compromise web-based systems, is that in modern web systems, the proprietary application or the application that the organization builds is a very thin layer that sits on top of multiple software layers mm-hmm. that are out of the control of the, organiza- of the organization's developers, mm. right? So if you're looking at yeah. WordPress... Like Oracle. The well, Oracle is a good example of that, right? I mean, there's example. so much code that you're relying on. A, yeah. gr- a great example. Or WordPress is another mm-hmm. one. Yeah, absolutely. The WordPress plugins right, um, other content management systems. Mm-hmm. So even if you build security into the proprietary application it's itself... Like it's always being undermined by that insecure exactly. platform, such as WordPress. Exactly. So what we do with this decoupled architecture, mm-hmm. we basically neutralize everything, any sort of vulnerability that could... Uh, could lie in the underlying software stack right, you're kind of and in then the middle leave of only those specific yeah. trails mm-hmm. into the application that can now be much better protected and have this impact. So even if you have a vulnerable WordPress plugin, right, there's no way to actually access that resource right, from the right, outside. Right. Even if you have that Shellshock vulnerability mm-hmm. in the BSD platform, there's no way to access it from the outside. The only mm-hmm. thing that is accessible to external users are this is this small group of actual business behaviors. Well, it's almost like you took the WAF from in front of the application and stuck it somewhere in the middle or back middle, I guess you'd call it, right, to, to protect the app. And the solutions that I've seen them are very effective have done, you know, just that. Right. So. Right, right. 
And it's... Uh, it kind of reminds me of almost like like Green Sequel, you know, right? They sit between the database. <laughs> it's another like taking that, don't right. go in front of it, go somewhere in the back. Right, yeah. right, right. And, uh, you know, the company started in Israel mm -hmm. about three years ago. Um, you know, uh, pretty much uh, I would say a, a, a very big market share in is of the Israeli mm -hmm. enterprises are using this technology to protect their web applications. Um, and we've just now moved into the U.S. I personally moved into the U.S. about nine months ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're, uh, our focus right now is to have these conversations with as many professionals as we can and uh, spread the word. Excellent. Excellent. Now, are you going to be at RSA? I am. I will not. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you're here now. That's great that you're here because we get to meet in person. Yeah. But no, I won't be at RSA. Well, we'll have to. But uh, lots of other people will be. Of course. So. <laughs> of course. But without you there, you know. I, it's, you know, it's just not going to be much of a party, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Israel, thank you very much. So before sure. we cut, I want to just talk about the five, uh, ask you the five questions. Oh. These are the same five <laughs> questions. You had the liberty of hearing John <laughs> answer those questions. Right. So you've had a little bit of time to, right. I don't know if you know I was going to be asking you those questions if you had some time to prep. I hope not because sometimes it's more fun. Anyway, three words to describe yourself. Well, um, maybe it's a little corny, but I guess uh, it's... Um, uh, my it's family, it's uh, my country, Israel, and it's uh, the startup that I'm involved in. Nice. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Well, um, you know, I like to keep things uh, kind of up close and personal. Mm. So I may go for one of these high voltage sh uh, shotguns. Nice. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Nice. If Don't you wrote tease a, me, bro. Yeah. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Um, I would say Risk as a Way of Life. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? You may find this hard to believe, but I have absolutely no idea what game it is. It's okay. It's, it's not a real game. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Now, now, <laughs> now, okay. So, so now that now that now I can actually <laughs> answer that. So I would go second. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Um, I would go for Kim and Kanye. That's a yeah. very interesting. I was going to say, you've been here in the U.S. I, for nine months now. <laughs> you've probably uh. seen how outlandish our celebrities are here. And you well, picked probably two of the most outlandish. Well, I believe in them, you know. I think it, it is, they have great potential as parents. Yep, I, 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 I seriously say that. You stand alone, but that's okay. <laughs> stand by your beliefs. It's okay. okay. It's okay. <laughs> Oh, well, Israel, uh, we're going to take a short break now. We're going to come back and uh, talk about stories for the week. So okay. uh, everyone stay tuned, especially Kim and Kanye. They watch the show, actually. Big fans. <laughs> Big fans. <laughs>